So um, I, um, this is year, where are we at here? We are year two of three into a grower trial project for strawberries, both fresh and processed. Um, but a lot of this um, information relates to fresh uh, for the most part anyway, because a lot of this was dual purpose uh, types of varieties. So uh, the Northwest Center for Small Fruit Research, we just actually finished up a conference um, in Ferndale uh, yesterday. And um, this was one of the funded projects that came through from that end. Um, working in Washington and Oregon uh, to look at some and hopefully facilitate some movement of some of these new um, trial varieties and selections that haven't even been named with the thought that, you know, keep the pressure on the, the risk on us fund, you know, with this, these funds rather than you as a grower having to risk, you know, having these on your farm before uh, trials come through. So um, these are the two years of plantings that we have in. Um, the main thing with the 2018 planting that I have to be honest with is when funding came in, it was very short notice and the season was on us. And I am based in Portland. Um, and so much of the, the work that I'm going to present today, which is preliminary at this point, was based um, mostly in Oregon fields. And so um, we, but we were able to get plants in the ground. So, you know, success. And then in the 2019 planting, those were um, actually mostly in Washington fields, but there are some in Oregon for comparison. Um, the, I'll go through the list of June bear, bearing um, selections that, or varieties that went in. Um, Bear in mind that we had, um, so a lot of this is subjective. Um, I'm going out there, I'm looking at these plants um, and you know, having my own subjective kind of evaluations on it. I'm talking to the growers that are gracious enough to have these on their farm, uh, so they have input also. Um, and so it's kind of a mix, mix and match type of thing. But I will say that the yields, um, particularly in Oregon, were down significantly this year. Um, that uh, I, Randy earlier today mentioned the, the cold snap that happened um, late February. And so there's a lot of speculation um, with growers in Oregon um, kind of pointing a finger at that to be um, the cause uh, for them uh, having the low yields. So Ruby June, this, um, you know, it, it's kind of a medium red, light medium red inside color. Um, so, you know, I guess from a perspective that we're used to when we think about June Barrier, perhaps it's not as an ideal color, but the growers actually really liked this flavor. Um, they, in fact, a couple of growers are planning on putting some larger acres in um, this coming year based off of, of what they're seeing. Um, and then this is around hood timing. I would say that there's probably, you know, preliminary assessment of 10 day gap between the harvest um, of first and second harvest. Fruit was average size, uh, but it was pretty consistent shaped. The, the yields were a little all over the place from two uh, to, you know, three and a half ton an acre, um, depending on plot. And um, one of the, you know, a couple of the random generated opinions um, and evaluations from growers included, um, you know, a lot of fruit kind of within canopy, cap stayed on very well. So from a fresh market perspective, that was nice. Um, it wasn't a really high powdery mildew year, so that wasn't significantly found on this. Sangria was the next one. Um, again, same type of coloring as Ruby June. This had a pretty tart taste to it. Uh, growers were not pleased. Um, I think, again, we're looking at between um, harvest timing, hood, between hood and future crimson. Uh, the, though when I was out there for first harvest, I was seeing quite a bit of bloom still. So I don't, I don't really know what's going on um, with that. But the fruit size itself was fairly inconsistent. The yield was actually, I mean, considering all the other yields that I'm listing here, 
was uh, a little over four tons of the acre. And then um, the fruit was fairly hidden in these canopies. Caps did stay on pretty well. One of the plots actually had, um, that's kind of why I had Stephen come and talk about some of the herbicide details is because one of the plots, the grower knew right away that he just wasn't able to get enough water on um, at planting time. And so he had some herbicide damage um, in his field that had these, these trials in it. And um, these plants actually, you know, of the ones that survived and actually a few, there's other, some of the other selections that I'll talk about right away that didn't survive as well. But um, these, you know, of them that survived, they did okay, actually. Um, the, there was another plot that had some um, fusarium slash verticillium suspect wilt stuff going on, um, and that definitely in, uh, affected um, some of the yields on that end. So Amelia is the next one, medium red inside outside. This was a pretty bitter aftertaste. There wasn't a lot of sweetness here. Um, one harvest seemed to be kind of a clear first harvest, but then the second harvest was fairly weak looking. Um, it's a round hood timing though. Small to medium size. Yield of plots were all over the place. This one actually was uh, really susceptible to both the, the wilt issues in the one plot and then the uh, herbicide issues in the other plot. So, um, you know, the, the yields kind of reflect that for sure. Overall, I don't think it's, you know, worthwhile in the Pacific Northwest. Light to medium. So Camilla was the last one um, for fresh only evaluation. This is light to medium inside color and then um, also from an outside color perspective. The, um, the <laughs> there was a huge range between kind of icky tasting and sweet. The uh, hood timing was kind of around this same harvest time. Small to medium sized fruit. For some reason, this fruit first of all, tended to have these really hooked ends and it was kind of consistently found, but I don't take great pictures, so I apologize. Um, and the other uh, mention was all of this puckering that was happening um, on these berries. So, and, and in general, the vigor of these plants was fairly poor. Um, again, really sensitive to the, the herbicide damage plot and um, so overall, even with the yield that was left there, you know, when you're getting this kind of looking fruit, it's, it was definitely not something um, from a Pacific Northwest caliper. So again, apologize for these dark photos, but it does comment, uh, it, it shows one of the comments that I have on here. Mary's Peak, um, Chad Finn talked about this earlier. He, uh, this is one from his program. I was evaluating it on a process market type of evaluation, but at the same time, all of this applies, it's dual purpose. Um, this is a really ideal red coloring. You cannot tell it from the photo, again, apologies. But one of the things that one of the growers commented about was they were a little worried from selling it from a fresh market perspective on the, the really yellow ex, uh, seeds that were on the exposed side of the fruit. Um, and you can, you can kind of see that, you know, obviously highlighted in these and so looking at that next to you know a Tillamook uh, set of fruit right next door um, where you didn't see that um, you know he was kind of worried that the consumers might be a little picky about that. This sweetness um, and flavor of this is really really on point. Um, I you know you saw the photo that um, one of my coworkers had taken he had posted on this is, you know, the, a hood replacement for a lot of fresh marketers. The harvest time, this is about a week after hood that it comes on. I would say it's similar to Tillamook processed um, kind of harvest timeline. In fact, a couple of growers were actually waiting or, or letting the Tillamook hang longer than fresh market picks for Mary's Peak, much longer actually. And so this was interesting to see. Medium to large fruit very consistent shape. Um, the, the yields, we had a dry land field or just by default because of water 
access issues in one of the plots. But um, so, you know, the range of yield um, was a little all over the place. But um, I, I know every, the farm that had the four ton an acre, that farmer, um, he said that that was probably the highest out of all of his yields, including Tillamook, that he had on his farm. So you can see like where we were at this year for how much of a decline it was um, this season. Um, overall, you know, growers are pleased. I know that, you know, this, this variety is probably around at this point, but um, the processors wanted to try it as well. So Putra Crimson, this is, you know, a little deeper red coloring uh, inside and outside. It really does have uh, some pretty amazing flavor. The one thing that I will comment about this is, you know, when it gets too dark, um, you know, not, not necessarily picked at that ideal time, uh, it, the flavor has the potential to be a slight bit whiny, wine tasting. So just be cautious of, you know, making sure you pick this at an optimal time. Harvest, similar to Mary's peak timeline. The uh, fruit size, medium to large, really consistent uh, shape. And then um, you can see the yields here are, you know, you know, a decent range, but not, yeah, just ignore the yields. This, this year was dismal. Um, so for the most part, the caps uh, stayed, you know, held on a little better than um, the standard. The, if on years that powdery mildew, you know, this was not a, a heavy powdery mildew season. And um, so Puget Crimson just came out okay. But um, in years that, you know, there is a higher pressure, this is one of those varieties where you gotta be on it um, because it, it will affect the fruit. It'll go to that, to that length. WSU 12-216.3 is the day neutral that we um, put into this trial this, at that 2018 planting. It is medium to dark red outside, uh, medium inside. It definitely was darker coloring than Albion, which is always you know, what, what day neutrals are pushing for. Um, it had uh, the best taste when it was darker in color, but to, you know, again, for the most part, growers and I also agree that it was a, you know, a little less sweet than Albion. Timing of the start of this was similar to Albion. Um, though there was a pretty significant lull in, in fruit production, more so even than Albion um, in that mid, early mid-July timeline. The size was a little slightly smaller than Albion, um, and that was proportionally, you know, lower um, in organic production um, between organic Albion and then organic of this selection. Um, the, I, I don't really know what to say about this, but general comment would be for some reason, you know, these would be in plots that, you know, had Albion right next to it. And I do, you know, just scouting in the fields and, and watching Ligus squad po populations for some reason, I don't know if this one is more sensitive to really, really, really low levels of um, ligus uh, damage, but um, for some reason, this, as opposed to the Albion right next door, it seemed to have more of that calf face that happened um, during the times that, that I was out there. Um, so it's something to maybe explore a little more of what's going on with that. Um, yield was from May to July, and this is based off of a two-row plastic culture system of about 16,000 plants per acre, um, was about seven and a half ton an acre. And then um, just some other grower comments. Um, they did actually really appreciate the compact plant. There wasn't a lot of runners off of these plants. Um, you know, from a, from a nursery side of things, I'm pretty sure Charlie is cringing, but um, I think that, you know, with the lack of the flavor from a grower perspective and then the consistency and the, the shape uh, and then that, you know, fairly heavy lull, um, I'm not really sure if this is going to be something that'll top an Albion. So I, in interest of time, I am not going to go over all of the, what, what went uh, into the ground in 2019. 
I did go out to the fields this fall to take a look at establishment. And in general, I would say all these plants established really well over this season. Um, and so the, the main, Chad discussed the Junes that went in, and these are both in process and fresh plots. And um, I will have updates on these as they get harvested next year. Um, from a day neutral perspective, there was uh, the, basically the way that I go about, and th this is one of the things that I should probably mention to you all. If you have suggestions of you know, uh, selections or recently named varieties, because this is a trial type of project, we can get things, or I have the ability to have access to things like Florida Beauty, which technically aren't released to the public yet, um, and they're only for Florida growers at the moment. And so um, I think that it's getting released, full release next year, I believe. Don't quote me on that. But because this is for trial purposes, I was able to um, secure some plants and get them into the ground in um, both of these states to take a look at it. So it's a good way for you know, us to jumpstart you know, looking at these um, and seeing how they're gonna shape out, out here. The um, two Lawson Canyon Nursery Day Neutral selections were included in this. Um, and then the last one was a request from a grower wanting to look at uh, Cabrillo, who, which is coming out of the UC Davis um, system, and uh, that, that's known to have high yields. So with that, I really, really, really thank the grower cooperators. That, that's the most important piece of this. Um, obviously, the nurseries factor in. There's a lot of communication um, between the breeders and the nurseries and, and then the growers and the logistics behind all of that, um, you know, takes, takes effort. And, and so I appreciate all people that are able to uh, participate um, as they're, they're um, you know, having to deal with me on a regular basis. But I will say all of the uh, results that I've discussed um, were on the flash drive that I talked about as well as the nutrient, uh, the new nutrient management guide that's on that flash drive that I spoke of this morning. Sorry, they're all gone. Um, but the other location that you can access a lot of this stuff would be um, the Fresh Market Strawberry Bulletin that we put out at least at a quarterly basis. Sometimes it's more often, just as I'm able to, you know, um, update it. So you can um, go to this web address to sign up for it directly, or you can just email me. And when I say email me, I mean, if you guys have a suggestion on a variety you'd like to see, um, we have one more year of funded um, grower trials. So, and if you are interested in being a grower cooperator, I'm always in for that too. So let me know, um, send me an email. I think that's it. So if you guys, ha I don't even know if there's time for questions. One question, if there is. If not, I'm, you know, around, so. Um, thank you. <laughs>